I think there is no need to introduce Bill Bartin to most of us. He has been visiting quite frequently in the last year at the department. He is definitely one of us, although we tried hard to hire him, but we failed. <laughs> he, he refused to come here for a long-term commitment, but we will keep trying. In any case, we are beyond happy to have him today talking about anomalies. The second class will be tomorrow at 11. Okay. I would like to thank the department for its hospitality during my visits here and uh, enjoy being in North Sierra and with the colleagues in the department. So today I want to, uh, at least two days, I want to talk about quantum anomalies. It's the story of symmetries and the fact that quantum anomalies, at least the way I'm going to present them, are, uh, can be viewed as a perspective of clashing symmetries. Now, symmetries play a huge role in the standard model of particles. Their four fundamental forces of nature are all based on local gauge theories. The SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 gauge interactions of the standard model. And in addition to that, uh, one can view gravity as a, a theory that has a local gauge invariance uh, related to the conservation of the the gauge invariance of the gravitational interactions. In addition, uh, there are a lot of uh, global symmetries, like isospin and uh, flavor symmetries of the standard model, which uh, are also described by symmetries, or approximate symmetries in this case. And anomalies also play a role in, uh, not only in the uh, realm of uh, local symmetries, but also in the realm of uh, global symmetries and the clash between global symmetries and local symmetries that can appear in some cases. So the consistency of, of the standard model, the local gauge, well, I should say one more thing. There's one more, if you like, fundamental force that was recently discovered, in a sense, with the discovery of the Higgs boson, the exchange of the Higgs boson is a, not a gauge uh, interaction, and therefore there is a, not all the forces of nature are uh, related to uh, local gauge interactions. Uh, and one of the features of local gauge interactions is that, at least on the surface, they preserve chirality. Whereas the Higgs force uh, flips chirality, or can break chirality. So, uh, and that's uh, an important distinction which will appear as I uh, talk about anomalies. So as I say, the, the uh, both Local and global symmetries depend on the existence of conserved currents, or at least the, uh, the presence of uh, uh, for symmetries to appear. Anomalies uh, arise through quantum effects uh, when these symmetries clash with each other. In other words, in opposing one symmetry, you destroy a, another symmetry. So. Sometimes not all symmetries can be, be maintained, and and that's uh, was a surprising uh, feature of anomalies that uh, wasn't uh, and it has a lot of consequences and it generates new phenomena that are actually observed in, in nature. So this is not just a a uh, sort of artifact of some mathematics. It actually has physical implications. So. Uh, as I said, hidden chiral symmetries also play an important role in their essential elements of the standard model. Now, chiral anomalies, uh, which I'll start talking about and generalize to the full gauge anomalies, uh, began as a small puzzle about the decay of a neutral pion to, to photons. Uh, but uh, as I said, this has become a much uh, bigger subject and uh, with many more consequences. But it started as this, so, yes, I've said all that. So I'll uh, actually go back, start my story in the 1930s, when uh, Yukawa uh, proposed the existence of a new particle with a mass between one and 200 MeV, based on the uh, uh, saturation of nuclear forces and the uh, short range nature of that force. So that, uh, and in some sense, the Yukawa interaction was uh, generated to explain that phenomenon. 
but it required, in that formalism, a new particle of uh, 100 to 200 MeV. Uh, in, the in the late 30s, Sakata tried to compute the lifetimes of these particles because a lot of the search for particles like this were in the context of cosmic ray uh, showers where new particles could appear and be observed. And it was important to know how, what the lifetime of these particles was. And uh, he wasn't totally successful in the, these calculations, partly to, due to the fact that uh, the interaction of photons with matter, photons were gauge symmetry, and it was very difficult to maintain the consequences of gauge invariance, and it was only later that this. Uh, but uh, as a consequence, uh, well, in the cosmic, in the, in the 30s again, the, a new particle was soon discovered following this prediction that there should be a particle. So I assume everybody got excited that uh, uh, it was uh, the particle that had been predicted was found, but of course that wasn't the case. What was discovered was a muon, and it had none of the interaction properties that one would expect of a particle associated with a nuclear force that should have strong interactions, whereas the muon has very weak interactions. So, but by the late 1940s, uh, accelerators had started to produce new particles, and uh, and uh, producing both charged and neutral pions. The, the charged pion was discovered first, and part of the story here is is related to the puzzles about the uh, neutral pion. By the late 1940s, field theory had also evolved and uh, methods to calculate gauge invariant amplitudes had been developed, particularly the Pauli Villars uh, regularization method, uh, which allowed one to calculate amplitudes uh, for particularly photons, etc., in a reliable and consistent way. So, uh, so these days, uh, there is a search for a new kind of dark matter, and there seems to be dark matter in our universe. And uh, at least my colleagues at Fermilab are very excited about looking for gamma rays or photons coming from the decays or the annihilation of these dark particles into the photons. Well, that's uh, not a, a new subject. In the late 40s, the same search was going on. Here it was looking for gamma rays coming from proton nucleus collisions which is the first paper, and a, a uh, I wouldn't call it a line, but a, I guess these days you would call it an evidence for, <laughs> anyway, a, a photon that was uh, on the order of 70, 80 GeV, or 100 G, MeV, sorry, 100 MeV or 70 MeV. And, and these gamma rays were not unexpected based on Yukawa's theory of the uh, pion, if you like, and people that developed that. Because the charged pions, which had been discovered earlier, should have a part now, which is a neutral pion. So the first observation was just single gamma rays uh, that seemed to be monochromatic, if you like. Um, and the second paper, uh, Steinberger et al., with Konofsky, uh, is a paper which actually saw uh, two photon uh, process processes making two photons which could be identified as the decay of a particle weighing about 140 MeV. And that was essentially uh, uh, what one might have expected if the charge pion had a partner. <coughs> In this second paper, they also studied angular distributions uh, to show that uh, the particle looked like it was pseudoscalar rather than uh, some other spin or like scalar or now, as I mentioned, uh, Jack Steinberger was a theorist at uh, the Institute for Advanced Study at the time, and while his name was on the experimental paper, uh, he was interested in trying to understand what, uh, that if we discovered these particles, how we determined what, they, what we're seeing. So he calculated uh, uh, the decays properties of various kinds of particle, particles to photons, two and three photons. 
And uh, as I mentioned, the public large regularization method uh, using uh, heavy fermion regulators, I mean, decay here is a decay where you, uh, uh, the particle makes a proton-antiproton pair, which then annihilate to two photons or three photons, depending on the process. So uh, in any case, and these diagrams for the, like the two photon process were very uh, singular. In other words, uh, the process in pseudoscalar to two, two photons with an elementary proton were linearly divergent, and therefore complicated the issue. However, if one could preserve the gauge invariance in a consistent way, the diagrams were actually finite. You gain two powers of mo momentum, if you like, or you have to expand out two powers of momentum because of the gauge invariance. So the pali Valar's regularization method was a very powerful method to allow you to calculate uh, difficult amplitudes that uh, were nevertheless gave definite finite results. Uh, but it was puzzling that uh, the pseudo-scalar coupling of the particle and the pseudo-vector coupling of the particle to the proton gave different results. Uh, and we get much different decay rates. So this is a picture of the paper by Steinberger and the predictions of the pseudo-scalar coupling and the pseudo-vector coupling. And the uh, decay rate uh, is much faster for the pseudo-scalar coupling than the pseudo-vector coupling. Now why is this a puzzle? The puzzle is that the axial, uh, the pseudo-vector coupling the divergence of that current is just the pseudoscalar current. And therefore, Steinberger basically didn't understand this result. And it's said by some that uh, at this point, he decided theory was unreliable and uh, focused the rest of his career on experiment and uh, accelerators and a very successful career as well. So this ended up being a curious puzzle, as I mentioned at the beginning. A lot of people didn't remark on it, just said, ah, it's a, you know, don't really understand it. And then far as symmetries go, which is the theme of my talk, the large nucleon the proton mass means that the axial vector current and the pseudo-vector current is not really conserved in this thing. It's just that these two different couplings give different answers. So I guess I should mention I just want to mention this paper by Schwinger, which is sometimes quoted, especially by Schwinger students, as, a, uh, as the birth of anomalies. In this paper, he actually shows that the pseudo-vector coupling is the, he starts with the pseudo-vector coupling, computes the pseudo-scalar coupling, so he shows they're equivalent, <coughs> in, a, in a sense. But what, and he uses point split currents to, and careful calculation of the thing, of the relation between the pseudo-vector and pseudo-scalar uh, couplings and shows there's no mystery, it's just uh, related. But that doesn't change the fact that of Steinberger's calculation that the local currents give different matrix elements, even if it can be understood as, and, as coming from the singular nature of the amplitude. And Schwinger didn't actually remark on the fact that, that there was this difference for the local current processes. He only showed that this point split currents could be related. So, now, as I said, uh, the uh, uh, axial vector current coupled to a, uh, for a proton is not conserved because of the large nucleon mass. However, one of the developments uh, later was, in fact, that while they, the, current, the nucleon current itself was not conserved, there was another current which included uh, a contribution from by the pion itself. And in that current, the, the current was conserved, at least in the limit where the, the pion was masked, it's called PCAC. And, uh, and this is an example of a theory with a spontaneously broken symmetry rather than a, an exact symmetry, uh, and a, rather than explicit breaking, which is the case for the 
just a massive nucleon. So the axial vector current in this uh, version of the theory got promoted to be a, a symmetry current. And in fact, uh, then uh, the axial vector current is conserved, or nearly conserved, and approximately conserved, as they say, in a little bit of mass of fire. And therefore, there was an enhanced role of axial, axial vector currents as a reflection of the chiral symmetry of the equations of motion. And then, uh, and the first paper I was told to read as a graduate student was the Gilman Levy paper on the Sigma model. And it's a theory of a nucleon and maybe proton, a neutron and proton in the real model, but uh, in the full model, interacting with ions and a scalar particle. And the theory had a, had a chiral invariance, or if you like, a conserved axial vector current, chiral symmetry, uh, or it would in the, if I eliminated this thing, this symmetry breaking term, which, but these interactions preserve the chiral rotations, which mix left and right uh, nuclei. Of course, this has the same mechanism as is used for the Higgs mechanism uh, later. So this is 1960. So sort of 20, 20 years after uh, uh, Steinberger's calculation and the origin of this puzzle, uh, Dell and Jakiv uh, and uh, Adler both in the late 60s came back to puzzling about two photon matrix elements and the inconsistencies of the, of the uh, that were basically discovered by Steinberger and trying to interpret them. So the first paper was called the PCAC puzzle where Alan Jackie looked at the divergence, looked at the coupling of the pion to the two photons and they used a truncated version of the gilman levy sigma model. In other words, it was just a proton, a sigma, and a neutral pion. And uh, they found, they essentially used Steinberger's calculation uh, for, for the two, so in the absence of, so if you look at the strong interactions, if you like, this has a conserved current, or approximately conserved current. And uh, they revisit the calculation of the two photon matrix element. And using the Steinberger calculation, in other words, Pallet-Villar's regularizations, the subtraction of uh, same diagrams with heavy, a heavier fermion, they found the same inconsistency that, that the pseudo-vector and pseudo-scalar coupling uh, were different, but uh, gave different results. But now in the combination that appears in the axial vector current, this is something that says that the divergence of the axial vector current is now no longer conserved. And that's because in the, in the, in the uh, sigma model, or the, uh, the version I showed you of, that there's a, a first term, which is a current matrix element directly, and then a, a term that involves the pion, they're expected to cancel when you take the divergence. But if the pseudo-vector and pseudo-scalar coupling have different matrix elements to two photons, they won't cancel. So as a result, uh, Bell and Jakiv, uh, uh, showed that the PCA we see was explicitly violated for two photon matrix elements. And they suggest uh, a way to cure this because they thought symmetries were <coughs> a particular way of calculating gives to something that violates a symmetry then uh, or you then see if you can if it's an artifact of the way you're calculating, or is it an intrinsic part of the theory? You have to differentiate between artifacts of calculation and uh, fundamental uh, parts of the theoretical. So they suggested that, uh, that one do pali Villars, but in a slightly different way. In other words, the coupling, the chiral invariant coupling of the regulator field would be sigma plus i tau dot phi that preserves the chiral symmetry. So if I rescale all the couplings by the same factor, when sigma gets a vacuum expectation value, it will be a heavier field. Uh, but now I preserve chiral symmetry. 
And as a result, they actually find then that the divergence of the axial vector current, or sorry, the, the, uh, they preserve the chiral symmetry. The current is conserved, but the coupling of the pion to, uh, uh, to photons is now highly suppressed, like the pseudo vector coupling, because basically the regularization of the pseudo scalar vertex is uh, uh, cancels off cancels off the uh, large contribution that you get from the other. However, uh, Adler in particular, who wrote his next paper I'm going to talk about, also came across the puzzle about the same time as Bell and Jacquive, and uh, he criticized this as uh, the fact that the regulator loops don't decouple. So this is not a really valid regularization of of a theory, you act, but it, uh, because you can't get rid of the regulator fields. The regulator fields are supposed to be there just to give you an ability to do a consistent calculation, but they shouldn't change the calculation. And remember, the pseudo-scalar coupling of the pion was, uh, after you did the probably the large regularization of that loop, it was uh, uh, perfectly finite. And here you're subtracting something different, and you're, in some sense, just canceling off the... Uh, now you might say, well, what's wrong with this calculation? And in fact, in some sense, there's nothing wrong with it, except it's not a statement of the original symmetry and current, uh, because in some sense, this lack of being able to decouple the heavy fermion means that you have to keep it as a dynamic part of the theory. So these days it goes under the term anomaly cancellation. Sometimes you engineer theory where there's an anomaly in some sector of the theory and an anomaly in another sector of the theory, and you arrange that they have the same strength so that when you add them together, there is no anomaly, and that means that that current is actually still conserved. Whereas the current, the theory for the one sector is inconsistent or at least doesn't have a conserved current, but the theory with both sectors does. So if you view this as just two sectors of the theory, one with a light fermion that gets its mass from the sigma vacuum expectation value, and a more strongly coupled one, but with opposite axial vector charge, then in fact there is a conserved current for this, and you have an anomaly cancellation. Also the fact that the, the uh, the coupling becomes strong means that the interactions of fermion loops, ions through fermion loops with this heavy fermion, as I say, don't decouple when you get extra interactions of the pions with themselves. And in some sense, those are what's called less amino terms. So let me talk about the other activity that was going on. Steve Adler. Uh, basically use quantum electrodynamics as a laboratory for studying field theory. He's used it many times uh, for different things. And at least he says in some review that he had just finished some horrendous computer calculation of neutrino physics, and he wanted to relax with a theoretical problem. And so he uh, decided to study properties of the axial electric current in quantum electrodynamics. Um, here, there's no ambiguity. There isn't any pion or there isn't anything. So you just have a laboratory. You have to compute the axial vector current. Everything's well defined. Uh, electromagnetic gauge in there and some power counting. It is a completely specified the matrix elements of the axial vector current. Uh, so it's well defined. And what he calculated, if I had to figure it so this is the kind of calculation one looks at where you have diagrams that involve a whole bunch of stuff, and the axial current attaches to the fermion line that's going through the process. Another set of diagrams is where the axial vector current couples uh, through a fermion loop, and then to photons, and then uh, to the fermion line, or just couples to photons, I guess. So what he observed in his analysis of this is that when you we're trying to check current conservation. You 
at least the way he was doing it, you had to, you dotted the momentum in the, of, to, for the divergence of the current, and then you manipulated some diagrams, and in doing those diagrams to get them to cancel, you had to shift momentum. Uh, and what he found was that, naively, if you just shift the momentum, just change the momentum variable, in one diagram relative to the other, it's just a, a relabeling of the momenta, and it shouldn't make any difference. But he found that in diagrams where that were linearly or more divergent, that wasn't true, that in fact, you got a finite remainder. And so, uh, the result of his analysis was that the divergence, the fact that there was this finite remainder was what was responsible for this discrepancy and while previously I talked about looking at the two photon matrix element of the axial vector current, Adler emphasized the fact that you had to view this as a, a modification of the axial vector divergence equation. In other words, the divergence of the axial vector current, which is an operator, is the naive divergence. QED is just 2m times the pseudoscalar thing, just like in the case of the proton. But there is an extra term, which is the photon field strength times its dual, uh, which is an operator and has to be treated as an operator. It's not just a matrix element. And, and therefore, you have to treat this as an operator equation and follow the consequences of that. So one thing that Adler can conjectured was that because it took a very special circumstance for this shift symmetry or the shift uh, in momentum to cause a problem, perhaps it wouldn't happen except in very special cases. And he conjectured that the anomaly coefficient is determined only by the sub-triangle diagram, which was linearly divergent. In other words, the original matrix element. Even if it's buried in a much bigger diagram, that's the only place that this shift in variance gets broken. That means that if that's true, then it means there's an exact, uh, that the, the operator equation that I wrote before is an exact equation as written. And it doesn't get corrected by uh, higher order terms and perturbation theory. So there's a, and it also follows, in QED anyway, that there's an exact low energy theorem for the matrix elements of the naive divergent. All the renormalization constants are fixed. And you can then uh, calculate uh, the low energy matrix element of, of the 2m times psi bar psi, where you want to be technical, it's 2m naught, where it's the bare mass times psi bar psi, is related to the uh, Photon matrix element, and the only renormalization is the renormalization of the of the electric charge. And this actually can be extended to all orders of perturbation theory. It's called a non-renormalization theorem. In other words, uh, I joined Adler in proof that this was in fact true in QED, and also did explicit calculations showing that uh, if you calculated the rate of corrections, in other words, add more photons and more loops that you could explicitly calculate and see that there weren't any other terms that arose that weren't just associated with the normal renormalization of that equation. So that equation turned out to be an exact result. And that's one of the things that makes anomal anomalies very fundamental in the sense that if it changed, the, the relation changed every order of perturbation theory, then it wouldn't be much of a relationship. It would be saying that there's a something happening that you then have to be very careful and calculate and maybe even do non-perturbative physics. But the fact that there's a non-renormalization means it might be very fundamental. And, and that's what I guess I've said in this slide. Um, and it has uh, important implications for not just QED, but all theories. As I said, the reinterpretation of the thing by Bell and Jacquive as was actually modifying the theory and not just calculating the theory. Uh, so where do we stand? Remember this was a 
started with the attempt of Jack Steinberger to calculate the lifetime of the photon. And he calculated it using point light protons coupled to photons and, uh, and got two different answers. Uh, by the mid-60s, the, the experiments that actually got good enough so you actually could determine roughly or had measured what the point-out lifetime was. And uh, so in 1965, the, uh, uh, the lifetime was about 10 to minus 16 seconds. And as measured by Bellatini at all. Uh, and this agrees with the prediction of the proton loop of Steinberger, roughly, at, at which was 0.86. And in fact, the current uh, uh, particle data group thing is an, essentially an exact agreement with Steinberger calculation of the proton, which is remarkable because now we don't view the proton as an elementary point like particle. But it follows from the fact that. What was really going on was the prediction comes from this anomaly structure. And the anomaly structure is, in some sense, there in the proton, but it's also there at the quark level, etc. So it is a much more, in some sense, it's much more fundamental than the actual original calculation. Now, neutral ion decay. Uh, so what does the measurement of this pi naught lifetime imply? Uh, well, as I said, Steinberger's calculation predicted uh, normalized uh, sort of the current prediction, predicted one uh, for based on a nucleon model. And I've written it as uh, sum of two terms. One is the proton loop and one is the neutron loop. And in the point-like picture, the neutron doesn't couple the photons, so it just gives zero. In the mid-60s, uh, the color triplet, I mean, the triplet quark model had been proposed as a constituent, a theory of the constituents of nucleons and strongly interacting particles. George Schweig, in particular, had what he called concrete quarks, which I always imagine it was some big concrete ball, but <laughs> I think he just meant they're real, real quarks. Uh, and in the, sort of the normal color triplet model, the prediction based on the fractional charge of the fractional charge of George Schweig's model, you would get a prediction of about a third of what, what's measured. Uh, or the amplitude is actually a third, so you're actually a ninth, so the fact you're almost 10 off. However, if you take it, it's the color triplet model of quark, which uh, had been proposed in various forms in the, mid, in the, in the 60s, uh, has an extra factor of three because of the color that's associated with each of the quarks. And that gives exactly back Steinberger's answer. So this was one of the several things that was evidence that color triplet quarks were a good candidate for the constituents of matter rather than sort of the concrete quarks of the slide. Uh, and, and Part, what was but, the difference between the concrete quark? The, the concrete quark model, they don't have any color. Well, Sly didn't, didn't uh, care about statistics. So he just had these quarks, and you just stick them together inside a proton. And there wasn't any quantum theory associated with it. They were just there inside. Um, and the Fermi statistics would say you shouldn't be allowed to I mean, if you wanted to make baryons, etc., that uh, you had to use boson, boson statistics to get all the states to work out right, or you just had to treat them as concrete quarks, well, my concrete quarks, where they're just lumps sitting in, inside and they have the charges that Slag assigned to them, and you say a proton's made of two up quarks and a down quark and sitting inside a proton, but for his quarks, they're just objects of, of, uh, of uh, fractional charge. Now, of course, going from his quarks to calculating these loops, which uh, is a different issue because he was just sort of trying to describe the physical states we see as hadron. Uh, but if I took that as a definition that there is just a point-like triplet quark inside and no other quantum number, then you get the, the prediction that's a fault by a factor of 10. Nevertheless, it's 
course, was that the insight into what got us to try to understand the nature of the constituents of that one. Anyway, that's sort of the side. Now, I'd like to talk about a calculation I made while I was still at the Institute for Advanced Study. I guess it's a good place to be. It's fine for who was there. And, and uh, I did this work, which is considered to be quite interesting. Well, I was spent one year at the Institute. I don't remember exactly how long the Steinberger spent at the Institute. Anyway, when I, I should say that when I started graduate school, I was going to be an experimentalist. I ended up being a theorist, so I went the opposite road. But it wasn't a calculation or an experiment that failed that, <laughs> that made me go the other way, but uh, other circumstances. So I was in, so inspired by my work with Adler and his work. I said, well, how general are these anomalies? So uh, how can they appear in other situations? So the, uh, so the question I asked was, let's consider interacting in its most general way with vector, axial vector, scalar, and pseudo-scalar uh, fields. And then we ask whether, the, if we calculate the fermion loop, whether there are anomalies associated with the fermion loops with these general couplings. Uh, so, using, so, if once I did that and I would say, well, then I'm, I know all the one fermion loop anomalies that can exist in four dimensions, because that's the most general uh, theory you can imagine writing down that's based on uh, at least the normalizable interactions. So this was a title of the paper. Uh, now, to do this calculation, I think nobody ever actually reads the paper and actually has ever reproduced the calculation. <laughs> but the thing you had to do was find a way of defining the loops. I mean, there are two ways to think about it. Can I define the loops in a way where as many symmetries as possible are conserved and by the regularization method? And then I only have to calculate a few things and, and see what, uh, what breaks down and then analyze that stuff. I took a different approach. I said, well, I just want to be careful. I want something that's completely well defined at every stage and doesn't embrace all the symmetries at once. <laughs> uh, but then I, so what I chose was to do a point split method, sort of like Schwinger's, except I didn't do all the path intervals and stuff that he did to preserve the symmetries. I said, okay, I'll just point split all the currents. And the trick was that uh, if I consider an endpoint function, the splitting I did between each point was divided by n. And that's because a ward identity or relation, current conservation, relates a, uh, diagrams that have n loops to diagrams that have n minus 1 loops. So I wanted to keep the amount of splitting the same whether I was calculating 3 loops, 4 loops, 5 loops. And that way I could easily manipulate the diagrams and calculate the things that didn't cancel. Uh, the price I paid for that uh, was that, of course, you break all the symmetries and their divergences, things that go like one over the splitting, etc. So you get divergences and you get uh, things, but they're all very well defined terms. And then the next phase is to see what, what of that is artifact and what's real. So we know that in the spinner electrodynamics case, if I did the same thing there, you would find, again, maybe there are a lot of terms that break, but you would find you add all the counter terms, and it's only the axial vector current that has the problem. And I could preserve the vector current conservation uh, in the spinner like the dynamics case. So here, the next phase of the calculation was to start adding local modifications of this loop, loop calculation to cancel off things that might have been uh, just artifacts of the calculation. Another, uh, another way of thinking is what I calculated, or the way I calculated was I calculated this effective potential or effective interaction of all the scalar, vector, axial vector, pseudo-scalar fields interacting through the fermion loop. You call that an effective action. And then I looked at 
did a gauge transformation on that effective action, which essentially then has, uh, gives me something which then I can integrate by parts. I mean, there's a shift of mu lambda plus rotation of all the fields. But when I integrate by parts, then I use the equation of motion to determine uh, uh, the relation to the diagram with a smaller number of vertices. So check the order of it. <coughs> so, uh, so the idea is that if you can add a local counter term to this effective action, which removes the, the, anomaly, the terms that I got by my explicit calculation, then that's just a modification of the definition of the S matrix that's still local in the fields. And, and in some sense, I've, I've just subtracted off an artifact of, the, uh, of the, this point split definition of the uh, explicit diagram. So anomalies, in some sense, are defined as the stuff you can't get rid of <laughs> by using that procedure. In other words, if, if you keep doing that, adding local counter terms, you find at some point you go around in circles. You can get rid of maybe an anomaly in one current, but it comes back somewhere else. So at that point, uh, you stop and say, well, this may be, uh, this is what we would call the anomaly. So anomalous divergence. So this is again a picture from my paper which shows you have the effective action, you do a, a gauge transformation, a shift of the vector and axial field, the plus is just has a one and a gamma five in it, so I'm shifting both the vector and the axial vector field. And if you uh, you get a term roughly that would be the normal gauge transformation. So if you're thinking of a gauge transformation, you throw it on the other side, and that's just the gauge, a gauge transformation of the effective action. And then if there's something left, this D is what doesn't, it, it, it shouldn't be there if the, gauge, the theory was gauge invariant. So as I say, with the point split method, you get a, a horrendous mess for this D function. And then you start adding counter terms until and recomputing what the, so you have to add a local counter term, you do the shift, the gauge transformation on it, see what it makes, and see if you can cancel off something. And in the end, after adding several of these things, I ended up with a D function, a sort of minimal D function, which uh, is essentially the gauge, trans the gauge transformation applied to the fact of action is this D function. And it's actually very simple. It only involves the vector and axial vector fields themselves. And all the scalar and pseudo-scalar fields I could get rid of by uh, uh, appropriate counter terms. And it has this very simple structure in the divergence in this form, which uh, isn't the form that's usually quoted as my result, <laughs> because it preserves the left-right symmetry. In other words, by the plus here, if I project on gamma phi being plus one or minus one, then uh, all the pluses would mean I'm dealing with left-handed currents and left-handed gauge transformations. So if I do minuses, it's minuses. Of course, a vector tra gauge transformation is a, a plus, plus a minus. So it is a combination. And what comes out of this calculation is that the anomaly of a plus gauge transformation are just plus currents. So right-handed gauge transformations only involve right-handed fields. Left-handed gauge transformations only involve left-handed fields. And in some sense, a lot of people view this as a more fundamental way of thinking about it. And one thing one should remember is that uh, left and right in four dimensions is just a arbitrary definition. There's no real distinction between left-handed uh, fields and right-handed fields. A, the antiparticle, the field for the antiparticle of a right-handed uh, Fermi neutrino, if you like, is a left-handed, transforms like a left-handed field. So you need both a left hand and a right hand to describe fermions in four dimensions. <coughs> so that means Calling a field left-handed or right-handed is, you, you could write every field as left-handed as a way of defining things. And so, in some sense, I don't think I realized that at the time, but 
in any case, uh, it's true. In other dimensions, that's not the case. You can have real fermions, or you can have uh, chi true chiral fermions, where a left-handed fermion is actually different than a right-handed fermion. But in four dimensions, there's no real distinction except a convention of what you call left and what you call right. So, as I said before, I could, I could get all the anomalous terms to cancel. And this is the generalization of the Adler anomaly, or the Steinberger anomaly, if you like, to uh, an arbitrary theory in four dimensions. And at this point, uh, I like this title of clashing symmetry. So now we see that, that in some sense, because the uh, gauge transformations only involve other gauge fields, it's only a, it's a clash between the symmetries. In other words, as I said before, the anomalous divergence of one current is only there, uh, depends on, if you like, if I didn't have other currents in the process, then there would be no anomaly. So it's actually a, interfer a conflict between preserving the, the gauge invariance of one current at the expense of other currents. In some cases, I mean, that's where anomalies actually exist. And, but there aren't any other anomalies. So it's only in clashing symmetries, which are the fundamental core of what an anomaly is, uh, at least viewed this way. Now, in my original paper, I was, wasn't done because even though uh, you can't get rid of the anomaly, you can change what it looks like. So for example, as I said, in the previous divergence I showed you, or anomaly thing, uh, you saw that a left-handed uh, current only was involved with other left-handed currents, and therefore there could be a conflict between these left-handed currents, but a left-handed current and a different right-handed current wouldn't have a conflict. However, in some theories like QED or QCD, vector currents play an essential role. So you might say, well, is there a way to redefine the fields or the, uh, or the loop functions so that you preserve uh, the vector symmetries. So that was an exercise I did. Uh, I, didn't, I guess I didn't show it, but you can find local counter terms where you modify the loops by adding local terms so that all the vector currents are conserved and it's only the axial vector currents that have anomalous divergences. So if you want to write out this full mess, uh, this is sort of a non-standard definition of what I mean by field strike, but anyway, that's what I, I used. So it, I mean, if you add and subtract these terms, you just get the V minus A and V plus A field strength. And then if you look at the divergence of the axial vector current, it's just what you would expect uh, if the theory had the gauge invariance. And if you look at the axial vector current, then you get the term that's normal plus this extra piece. And so that's usually quoted as a full, what's called non-abelian uh, anomaly. But as I say, sometimes it's easier to think in terms of this left-right symmetric version of the, of the calculation. It depends on the application. If I only were dealing with vector currents, in other words, the standard model, which is the SU3 and the photon, then it would be natural to this then only axial vector currents that were flavor symmetries would have anomalous divergences. But now in the full standard model, that's not the case. The uh, SU2 cross U1 fields are chiral, and therefore you want to if you want to preserve local uh, gauge invariance, you, you can't use the definition I used here of the loops to, uh, for the standard model calculation because some of the axial vector currents that are, play a role in the dyna local gauge dynamics of the standard model would not, obey, not be locally uh, gauge invariant. So it depends on the application, what form of the anomaly you should use, and it's important to know what are the dynamical currents and what are the sort of 
which have to preserve the local gauge invariance for consistency, and what are the flavor currents, if you like, that may or may not have anomalies in their divergence, but uh, they still be interesting in terms of the flavor symmetries of the theory. So I, I sort of wanted to say it's remarkable that, uh, that, uh, you know, that it's only this very limited set of anomalies that, that survive. Uh, and, uh, and it represents, as I say, this clashing of, of symmetries that is fundamental. And this calculation is only in four dimensions. There are different forms of the anomaly in other, various other dimensions for currents and other operators, uh, which maybe I'll talk about next time. Uh, there's also a different way of calculating this using a path integral approach where the fermion determined is part of the measure, fermionic measure in calculating anomalies and Fujikawa and others uh, have talked about this form of talking about anomalies and it's the fact that the fermion determinant that appears in a functional integral over the gauge field is not invariant under these transformations uh, and that was emphasized by Fujikawa in particular. In addition, uh, there is a generalized non-renormalization theorem, as I said, in, in, uh, in QED, Adler conjectured and we proved together that there are no ultraviolet radiative corrections to the anomaly, the, the bare charges that appear there are bare and then get renormalized by the dynamics. There are no additional terms that change order by order. Uh, and in 1972, I revisited the problem and showed that that uh, there was a form of this non-renormalization theory even in the most general case in four dimensions. It's more or less based on the fact that you can regularize bosonic loops in a way that doesn't break this chirality in the same way that the fermion loops do. And if you've sufficiently regularized the theory, theory <coughs> the, the regularized theory is finite except for the fermion loops that appear inside the diagram. And therefore, if you study, in, in some sense, you can compute the fermion loops first, if you like, and then do the integral over the boson, the regularized boson theory. And if you've shown that the only anomalies that exist are those of the fermion, there are anomalies in the fermion loops, but you don't generate any new ones by doing the bosonic integrations. So an argument like that is what I use to argue that that in fact the non-abelian anomaly has a form, a kind of non-renormalization theorem that was like the QED calculation. Uh, there are other ways of studying the non-renormalization theorem. Tony Z, uh, in particular, used renormalization group methods to show that the anomaly coefficient didn't get renormalized. Uh, One thing that's interesting is that if you look, if you think of a functional integral of normal fields and you rescale the gauge field, so instead of having the coupling be G times the gauge field, you just say the covariant derivative is D mu plus A mu. Then the kinetic term for the gauge fields goes like 1 over G squared, and that does get renormalized. But the anomaly terms are in that way of describing it, are zeroth order in the coupling. While you calculate a loop to find them, they actually behave like coupling constant to the zeroth power. And in some sense, that's the way they can have a non-renormalization theorem. Because if I said a theory was you know, exactly g squared, then, then you have to say what g squared? <laughs> we know coupling constants run and change and all that. So if I said that the fundamental anomaly was g squared, it would imply that I would have to ask that question and then I, I wouldn't make sense of a non-renormalization theorem. The fact that it actually goes like coupling constant to the zeroth power is why it remains a fundamental uh, part of field theory in four dimensions. So I think this is where I'm stopping today's lecture. Yeah. I guess I should have asked in the beginning, you're supposed to ask questions of, uh, rather than hear me.
Okay, thank you very much. Any question? Well, maybe I'll ask more tomorrow. Well, maybe I'll make a comment. At the beginning, when you were talking about this was the new one anomaly which is rigid, and now you are getting into uh, Ronaldinian uh, yes. anomalies which correspond to gauge uh, anomalies. Yeah, but both. I mean, I would say they're all parts of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and tomorrow's lecture, I will be humiliated a bit by Vesim Zemino uh, in terms of uh, their analysis of the structure. And sort of says all the hard work I did, you didn't really have to do. <laughs> uh, you only had to do the Abelian one. But that's tomorrow's lecture. So, uh, uh, in any case, uh, so. You know, today's lecture was very much nuts and bolts, calculating Feynman diagrams and dreaming up regularizations and methods of calculating so you can get reliable results and, and see what happens. Uh, but anomalies, in some sense, have a much more fundamental, uh, a much more fundamental uh, property of field theory, and uh, I'll probably at least describe a little bit of that. Yeah. Anyway, they're here, they make the pine off decay. <laughs> they um, do lots of other things, which again, we'll talk some about tomorrow. Any other question, comment? Okay, if not, let's say, we can we get together tomorrow at 11, it could be nicer, not so cold. Tomorrow is at 11. Tomorrow is at 11. Yes. Okay.